Now, I went over time by several minutes. I'd like to say you're going to get that back on the back end, but that's simply not true, and you're not supposed to lie in church. So I am going to continue this morning. We have gathered. It is a special day, and we are here to worship God, and that is what we are doing simply by our mere presence today. As we focus our hearts and minds on the Lord, let us open our, open our ears and our hearts and our minds to the Lord's leading this morning as he is with us. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. So we claim the presence of the resurrected Christ among us as we have gathered to worship today. Good morning. morning. Please stand as you're able for our call to worship. Place your trust in the Lord, for God will provide. Place your trust in the Lord, for God is with you. Come, place your trust in the Lord every day in all your ways. Our opening hymn is Rejoice, the Lord is King, on page 715. The words are also on the screen.
If you will, please turn to page 12 in your hymnals for the invitation, con confession, and pardon. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment for silent prayer, please. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Let's exchange signs and words of God's peace. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. As we uh, come to a time of prayer this morning, uh, a couple things. I, I would like to do two things at once. I failed to, to uh, mention these in the opening. Um, while we're not going to, we're going to have a commissioning prayer for some of our members who are uh, preparing to head to Mexico and on mission next week, and so I wanted to make sure that we kept also in our time of prayer some of our church family um, in our prayers as well. So I just wanted to share these names and keep them before you as we pray. Uh, continue to keep Anne Francis in your prayers. She has moved to uh, 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 the rehab, the Jewish rehab right up here uh, off of uh, off Walnut Grove. Uh, spoke with her son Michael this past week, and she is now there. Uh, and I do have her room number if anybody is, is, is interested. Uh, and so be, be, uh, we'll be in contact for her as well. She's rehabbing and trying to get better. Uh, please keep Billy Flack in your prayers. He had knee replacement surgery. He's uh, heading to Germantown Rehab. Uh, uh, please keep in your prayers um, the family of L Leroy Daniels. That's Roger Daniels' father who uh, had a stroke and suddenly and uh, passed away. So please keep Roger and Holly in your prayers as they're in Ohio. Uh, please keep Debbie Bruins in your prayer. That's the daughter-in-law of Jill McCord. Uh, she's uh, been placed on hospice. And so we want to keep all in all, her and uh, all her family uh, in prayer and comfort, God's comfort as she is uh, uh, preparing and being cared for and kept comfortable during this final phase. Also, please continue to keep in your prayers Joanne St. Lawrence as she is continuing to uh, 
uh, trying to uh, rehab and get better and uh, get back on her feet and start to feel better. Uh, so please keep Joanne in your prayers uh, this morning. I know that's a lot, and uh, we do ask that the Lord would hear our prayers this morning and every day as we lift up our brothers and sisters uh, who are uh, in not, not doing well. And so we just want to lift them up. Uh, this morning, uh, we are uh, commissioning, as I mentioned, we have uh, three members uh, of Covenant United Methodist Church who are preparing uh, to join up with a sister United Methodist Church, Peace Tree United Methodist Church, as well as Bahalia United Methodist and Icon Ministries, and I think there may be one more group, uh, but they are heading to Rio Bravo Ministries in Reynosa, Mexico next Saturday. They'll be gone for a week. Uh, they uh, they're spending fall break in Me fall break in Mexico, so uh, they're going to be serving the children there at uh, is it Hogar, not Hogar Montaña. I I'm sorry, I lost the name of the children's home there. Children's home and school that they'll be serving there, uh, and so uh, so I want to ask uh, Robin Anthony, Jennifer Cavett, and Charlie Cavett to come forward and stand before you this morning. Um, And y'all just stand right here in the, in the front. Uh, and so we're going to be praying for them in both services today, but particularly uh, we, today we recognize uh, the ministry of Robin, Charlie, and Jennifer, uh, and the special task that they have answered God's call to serve. Um, they're going to be serving this week in lots of different ways, just working with children, having fun, teaching them scriptures, praying for them, and supporting the ongoing work of Rio Bravo Ministries. They'll be flying out to McAllen and crossing the border uh, on, by way of vehicle, and so we'll also uh, want to keep them in your prayers for safe travel back and forth uh, in and out of the country and for their time there. And so today we want to commission them and also be reminded to be praying for them over the next couple weeks as they partake in, this, in uh, this work and also represent not only the body of Christ, but this particular body of Christ here at Covenant United Methodist Church. And so Robin, Charlie, and Jennifer, I commission you in the name of this congregation to the work that, uh, that you have set out to do. We pledge you our prayers and our encouragement and our support. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you in this and all things that you may do God's will in service to Jesus Christ. Let us pray, and I'm going to ask that you would extend your hand to the three of them here as we pray together. Loving God, you have entrusted us with the message of your power, grace, justice, and love. We ask for your guidance that we may be teachers and learners together, and particularly for these three before us. We believe that you are in our midst and you set apart as we uh, endorse your setting apart of those who would serve in mission to Rio Bravo Ministries, Robin, Charlie, and Jennifer. May they serve you in nurturing the spiritual growth of all who are entrusted to their care. Bless each one gathered here. Enable them to be channels of your grace. And we pray all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. They, they'll be with us this week, but they are going to be uh, traveling out next Sunday, so we won't, we won't get to see them. So uh, God bless you, and we will be praying for you all during the week, uh, weeks to come. This morning, uh, as we prepare for, to receive our offering of worship through giving, um, I do want to remind you what I would ask is that you not place uh, your estimate of giving in the offering plate. Save that for the end we will be uh, laying those on the chancel rail uh, today uh, as, as, a, as our commitment to the Lord. So as we come and receive the gift of grace that is through the Lord's uh, Supper today. Uh, so I do want to remind you to use your orange card to um, register your attendance. Place that in the offering plate if you did not do that electronically. So this morning, one of the interesting things is... Um, the offering, I don't know if anybody does, anybody, does anybody know that the offering is always supposed to be done before communion? Did anybody know that? Do you know why? Because in the old days, communion was made, the bread and the juice was all made in community. And so all the gifts of community would be brought forth and put together at the table of the Lord. And so in order to approach the table of the Lord, we would first bring our gifts and offer them to the Lord. 
And so a big part of that was sort of the work of the community together and laying it before uh, the Lord at the altar as a sacrifice. But it was important to remember that it's in our, through, through the gifts that we have, God has given us. We give them back to God and we come to the table to receive once again those gifts back as they have been perfected by the Holy Spirit. And so part of the way our worship is written out, it's written out so that the offering, the liturgy is all written out so that the offering happens before the Lord's Supper because it represents us bringing our gifts and lay them at the Lord's feet before we receive uh, the ultimate gift from, from the Lord, that is his body and his blood. So that's a big part is that we are offering our gifts to the work and ministry of the church. Now, oftentimes we lay our gifts in a plate or through a website or we mail in a check through the U.S. Postal Service and cross our fingers that it gets here. Um, but ideally, what we're remembering is we're not just placing it somewhere. We are actually laying it at the feet of Jesus as our offering to give back a portion of what he has given us so that we may receive too this gift of grace from our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may go back out and generate more gifts and offering to generate more love and grace, to generate more joy and peace in the world around us. So that's a, a little tidbit as to why we do things in the order that we do. And so today, uh, as we, as forgiven and reconciled people, that's what we just did with the invitation, confession, and pardon. Today, as reconciled people, we offer our gifts back to God and we lay these gifts at the feet of Jesus. Let us pray together. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you and we praise you for this day. You have given us every good and perfect gift. You have lavished upon us uh, everything, every good grace that we could possibly experience. In this moment of worship, we ask for just a moment for you to remind us of your goodness and grace. Remind us of the blessings that you have given us. As we then in turn take a portion of that and bring it back and lay it at the foot of the cross. And as we have paused just for a moment to give thanks. We pray Lord that you would now receive these gifts. That you would take them and perfect them according to your will. For the continued mission and ministry of your church. Not just here at Covenant United Methodist Church, but through your church universal, so that we may do our part in help strengthening the body of Christ here on earth, so that your will may fully be done, and we may fully celebrate in the kingdom that is and is to come. Bless these gifts. Bless us as we give. Help us to continue to grow in the, in the grace of giving and the grace of generosity. For your sake and for the sake of the world around us, we thank you and we praise you for this time and this day and these gifts. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Our scripture today is from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May be seated. We have been exploring uh, generations, generative nature of human life, the generative, generative, generative nature of, of God's uh, love and life in and through us, the generative nature of God's love. God's love and the blessing that it begins in our life sets life into motion for us because God's generosity generates within us gratitude. And it's up to us to respond in gratitude, to apply that gratitude in our life. This week, we're going to be wrapping up this series. Some of you may shout out, amen. Some of you may be like, oh, I wish we'd do more of this. Don't worry, we will. And um, uh, just like Healthier 901, I'm, gonna, I'm like a dentist drill. I may sound annoying, but I'm not going to stop till I get out what I need to get out. We're looking at the transformational impact of gratitude and generosity, and we are doing so reflecting on the generational impact. Let's face it, very few people in this world and in this life are born naturally generous. Very few people are born with a generous disposition. Because one of the first words that we learn at the age of two, mine mine no my yeah yes no and mine you're right no and mine so so when it comes to generosity we've got to unlearn and relearn we have to unlearn and relearn and and the good news is that generosity is is like riding a bike here's what I, I mean by this I actually brought a bike this morning uh, y'all probably some of you may have seen it and you thought what in the world and uh, you see, I'm just going to disrobe here in front of y'all. Don't worry. Uh, y'all are going to know what's under the robe after today. Uh, but I want to show you something. I'm really pr proud of this. I'm really, really proud of this. 
Gotta pull my britches up. I've lost half a pound. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, 40, we're up to like 45 people. That dentist drill is going to keep going until we get to 100. Uh, so here we go. I'm going I'm to show you something. Pants are a little loose. I'm just going to ride this here. So y'all see what I'm doing? Yeah, all right. Here we go. I'm going to hop off. I'm going to leave it back here so it's out of the way for communion. But what did I just do? I rode my bike. I rode my bike. I know I rode it in church. But I rode my bike. You know, generosity is kind of like riding a bike. You're not born able to ride a bike. And then when you start riding a bike... There are a lot of considerations to be made. Is it the right size? McKenna, could you ride that bike? Probably not. I don't think your legs could reach the pedals. It's not your size, is it? And so, so if McKenna wanted to ride the bike, she had to get a different one. One that fits her. One that she's able to start on. You know, generosity is a lot like that. We see people doing it, and we assume that we're just going to start doing that. I've made up my mind. I'm going to be generous, therefore, I'm just going to start giving away everything I've got. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it can. It can. But for most people, it doesn't. They see what it looks like, and then how they grow in generosity, they take steps. Just like riding a bike. Now, I know when you were looking at me just a second ago... You knew that although you weren't sure that I was going to make it all the way down without falling over, I've never had to do it in front of people. It's really nerve-wracking. And I, and I realized I forgot my helmet, so I'm glad I didn't fall. But it took a lot of training and learning to get to the point and ride a bike. You can see somebody riding a bike, but if you've never done it, I promise you the likelihood of you jumping on that bike and doing exactly what they did is slim to nil. Most of us start off riding a bike one of two ways. The bike I first started to learn how to ride was an old Cub Scout bike. Had a banana seat, no kickstand, in a gravel parking lot. Right? And Dad, if you're white, I'm just kidding. But that's how I started to ride. And, and how it worked is, is I would get on the bike, and first I'd have to learn that it takes some coordination. You don't just hop on and start pedaling. Right? You, there's these little things up front called handlebars. Help you steer. You got to keep it straight. And you got to keep it straight at the same time you're pedaling. And you got to sit up straight. If you're not sitting up straight, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fall over. And then you start, you start with a little bit of um, somebody, maybe somebody's holding the bike, or maybe you got training wheels. Maybe you're fortunate enough to have training wheels on your bike. But even when you start riding on two wheels, you've got somebody that holds the bike, walks alongside of you, and what are they doing? I, I remember when Jennifer and I were teaching our girls how to ride their bikes. Uh, okay, pedal, sit up straight, hold steady, sit up straight, keep pedaling, and we're going right alongside, and we have not let go of the bike yet. And it takes a minute, it takes a minute. And then suddenly the point comes where they're going a little bit faster. You kind of let go for a minute, you're like, grab them, you know, and then you're hovering all around them because you don't want them to fall and hurt themselves until suddenly they get to a point where they just are comfortable enough, they've done it enough, they just jump on the bike and start zipping around the neighborhood in front of cars and everything. <laughs> Generosity is like that. Discipleship is like that. Even growing in our faith journey is like that. We have to begin wherever we are before we get to the place that we have envisioned our life of being. We don't start out at the end. We don't start out at expert level. We learn and we grow and we move until we begin to master it. You see, sometimes we forget that discipleship is more about mastery 
doing it enough times, living this life enough times, doing it enough ways and trying it and failing and trying and failing and trying and succeeding and trying again and failing and keep working our way up until we master the life of Jesus with our life. Master the life of the master. Generosity is the same. We see the bike. We don't know how to ride it, but we want to. So we, have, we hop on the bike. Somebody holds it for us. They're telling us what to do. And then when the first time we hop on the bike, even when we're riding it on our own, we have to tell ourselves what to do. All right, keep it straight. Keep it steady. Keep pedaling. All those things that mom or dad said or grandma or uncle or my wonderful neighbor, they, what they were saying to me, I got to remember to do all those things until one day I just hop on and I don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just a part of who I am. And the problem for some of us is that we forget that when we've got into mastery and we just hop on and ride off, we can't teach anybody anything. No, we have to go back to where we were thinking through the steps so that we can share those with somebody else. You may be thinking, you know what? I, th I, I do believe the Lord wants me to be generous with my time and my energy and my resources. I do believe that Jesus wants me to be a generous person because that is the model that he has put before me and how he calls me to live. And we can say today that oh, I am going to start being generous today. But in reality, there are some things we have to unlearn and things we have to relearn. Generosity is one of those things that we look at and we say, oh, we want to do that. We want all the benefits. We want to make that same kind of impact. But it just doesn't feel like it comes together. So we stop for a little bit. And then one day we try to get back on it. For many of us, we don't see the life of generosity as a journey that reflects our discipleship. Today, has anybody seen one of these? Have you seen one of these today? That's what this is. I know it's not somebody holding your bicycle for you. This is a generosity map. This is just one of the ways, a tool that you can use to know how you are growing in your generosity. And you start at the top, one to five, five being sort of at the mastery level. But you see here, part of this is to give us a way to see what generosity looks like and how we can grow in it. Because if we don't have a plan to grow in generosity, we are not planning to be generous. I'm going to say that again. If we do not have a plan to be generous, then we are not planning on being generous. And so the generosity map, this is not the end-all, be-all. It's just a guide. It's just a tool. Helps us from beginning generosity where we just pick something to give. Something. Start anywhere. And we move to growing generosity where we increase just a little bit as the Lord leads us and guides us. And third, we become intentional. That we, sometimes we might, for, for example, if we're talking about our estimate of giving, I might just say, well, I am, I've never really given it the full and I, I just can't get to 10. Well, guess what? Nobody said you had to start at 10%. Start at 1, 2, 3. Start somewhere. And then when you get to intentional percentage, then you can move into biblical generosity. You want to get to that goal, maybe that tithe, which is a goal, a standard. And then you, grow, you can actually grow past that to what, what we call visionary generosity. That's just where you're, you give whatever you can above and beyond the 10%. You, you're giving because you see God's kingdom work happening and you want to support that with more than what maybe some people feel like you ought to. But here's the deal. Even on the back here, there are some questions. What's generosity? What are means of expressing generosity? Does it matter where I am on the map? What are some ways I can practice generosity? It's just a tool because if we are not planning, making plans to be generous... We are not planning on being generous. It gives us a place to work up to. This is, these are, this is started like the training wheels, kind of.
generosity works in the same way as riding the bike. Sometimes when we begin to be generous, we do it because we feel like we ought to. We're supposed to. We have to. And it seems so mechanical and, and transactional even. And, th and this rubs us just a little bit that it doesn't feel right. It seems mechanical and transactional. How can something that feels mechanical and transactional in us become something that, be that it feels so natural and transformational? Well, just like riding that bike. We start and we continue to practice it until it becomes a part of who we are. You know, one thing that I tend to struggle with in the scripture that we have for today I have heard this read on days such as this, and they read all the way through the parable of the talents. I'm not touching that. There's something that rubs me about this passage today, though, that precedes it. It's a part of Scripture, Matthew 25, that is, that is known as the judgment of the nations. And even just the subtitle alone feels ugh. the son of man comes in glory he's going to separate people like a shepherd does sheep and goats and we hear the story of why right if you did for the least of these you did it unto me if you did not you did not do it for me and I don't know about you, but one of the ways that I have always taken this passage is that if we are, and basically if we are not loving, the gist of it is, if we are not loving others and giving to others, it's an affront to Jesus. And it makes us feel like we have to do it because we don't want to offend Jesus, right? We all want to be on Jesus' good side. Because he died for us and all. First of all, he died for you before you were ever on his good side, by the way. But we feel like we have to. Because we never know when we're doing it directly to and for Jesus. First of all, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like have to's. Somebody tell me, you have to do this. I don't have to do anything. That's usually my first response. It's like a knee jerk, you know, it's just like a reflex. I get that little hit on my knee. I don't have to do anything. Now, I ought to, or I, if I want a better outcome, I might want to do something. There's more. But the more I reflect on this passage, when I think about this as a have to, man, it seems really unattractive. It does not make me want to do that. It feels very mechanical and transactional. But you know, the interesting thing about this is not what the people did to the least of these. It's that Jesus separates people like sheep from goats. How would a shepherd differentiate a sheep from a goat? Well, they're different animals, and they look different, and they act different. And when it comes to our life of discipleship, living our lives in Jesus' way, living into new life and love, we become different. We become different. We begin to look different. Our lives begin to look different. And particularly with generosity. Because generosity is one of those things that, that as we are called to do, we continue to do it until it becomes something that we are. It's about growing until we don't even have to think about it anymore because it's just who we are. We are loving and generous as Jesus is. It's 
And it's a generational impact when we live that way. Being generous people like that. In the parable, Jesus highlights the one on his right entering the kingdom. The ones, those are the ones who feed life. They set life into motion, giving food to the hungry, hydration to the dehydrated, a warm welcome to someone who's seeking a place to belong, cover and warmth to those who are vulnerable and exposed, care when people don't care for themselves or can't care for themselves, and relationship and connection to those who are isolated. Those are things when we do them and we are generous in giving of ourselves that truly set life into motion. And we do it because it's been done for us by the power of Jesus Christ. And our gratitude begets the generosity. And so, so we think of the first one as being the one, those are the ones who gave. Well, what's the other one? Well, the opposite of giving is depriving. Jesus is saying, I recognize my people because they are givers, not deprivers. They are setting life into motion, not taking away life. That really puts a new spin on thou shalt not kill, doesn't it? I recognize my people because they are givers, not deprivers. And secondly, it's a generational impact because when you learn and live into it, do you know... Who teaches people to ride bikes? Who teaches people how to ride a bike? Other people who ride bikes. People that already know how to do it. People who have already mastered it or are learning. Because I'll be honest with you, the kids in the neighborhood who just started learning, they're good coaches too when your kids learn how to ride a bicycle. And with every person they teach, they create a new generation of bike riders who will teach others. And this is how it works when following Jesus. It's how it works with generosity. I know generosity is one of those things we don't talk about because it's nobody's business. Right? Wrong. Yeah, we've been told that's just between you and Jesus. But I don't know about y'all, but in my family, if it affects one of us, it affects all of us. And so we too need to be people who are growing and learning and continuing to grow and learn to teach others not only the life of discipleship, but the life of a generous God who loves us deeply and intently. That is generational discipleship. Discipleship that begets new generations of disciples. And it doesn't, they don't have to be young either. That's what making new disciples is all about. When you make a new disciple, you're starting a new generation of disciples. Whether they're 90 or 9. It's generative. And so is generosity. It has a generational impact. It begins when we keep moving from something that might seem mechanical and unnatural, might seem transactional and not transformational. But we're encouraged to stay at it until one day we can do it for ourselves. One day we can move ourselves about in this life until it becomes a part of who we are. For it's through this that you will inherit the kingdom, the life that is overflowing, a life that is more than you could ever hope for. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. This morning as we proceed to the Lord's table, I want to invite you to join me for the great Thanksgiving. At this time, uh, is it just there? I do want to remind you about uh, our missional impact in 2024 on our estimate of giving 
in our, uh, our dreams, our commitments. Uh, I want you to remember this. Um, as a, as a day in which, you know, we have some very, very generous people in our church who would do a really great job at teaching the rest of us to be generous. We have some really wonderful disciples of Jesus in this church that would be really, really great to teach the rest of us how to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's going to require you to get out of your pew, just like it requires us to get us out of our pew to get up to this table. The kingdom of God is dependent upon you. The work of the Holy Spirit does require your cooperation. And the grace that God gives us requires a response. So as we come to this table of grace today, let us be reminded that our response is not just to get up and come forward, but our response is to receive the grace of Jesus Christ and then in turn go and be a channel and vessel of that grace in every area of our life. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You made people from one, made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the end of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread. He offered it to each of his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and offered it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ returns in final victory and we shall feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray with the confidence of children of God, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I will invite those who are assisting this morning to come forward. This is the table of the Lord. This is not the table of the United Methodist Church or Covenant United Methodist Church. This is the Lord's table. He earnestly invites you. All those who repent of their sins, seek to live in peace with one another, to come receive this gift of grace today. 
We'll be serving by method of uh, offering the bread and the juice. You'll get an individual piece of bread placed in your hand, and you will also be given uh, a cup. At that time, uh, you may consume it directly. Uh, we invite you to leave your estimate of giving card, Michelin Impact card, on the chancel rail. This morning, if you need to stop and pray, the chancel rail is open for you to do so. If there are those present this morning that desire to be served at your seat, if you'll just remain seated and once everyone has gone through the line, simply raise your hand. We'll extend the table to where you're seated this morning so that you may also partake of this gift of grace. Body of Christ, give me thanks. Thank you, Lord. Body of Christ, thank you, Lord. Body of Christ, be the jam. Body of Christ, give me thanks. Let's have this. The table is set. Once the, uh, once the choir and the musicians come forward to receive, we invite you to begin with the front row and work your way back. Come down the center aisle. You can return through the outside aisle. There are uh, receptacles on either side that you can place your used cups in. Come and receive the gift of grace.
I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together our closing hymn, verses 1 and 2 in the refrain for Wonderful Words of Life by Philip Bliss. Um, I'm going to ask you to say that while I finish up over here. Philip? Yep. Oh, sorry. Put you on the spot. Um, I, I get to switch things up, too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you can direct this. Uh, hey, uh, well, Philip Bliss, I, I know you all know the story about it. It is well with my soul and the song and everything. It is well with my soul. Okay, that was not written by Philip Bliss, but that was written by another person. But Philip Bliss is the person who wrote the music of the song we're about to sing. And there was great tragedy with the guy who wrote it as well, because, you know, his four daughters drowned on the way to Europe. His wife survived and everything. Well, Philip Bliss, a few years later, he wrote, well, actually, right after uh, the guy who wrote it as well wrote those words, Philip wrote the song it as well, but he also wrote this song we're about to sing. And the sad thing about Philip is he wrote all sorts of hymns, and he had in his life there was a train accident, the greatest one that ever happened in this state, up in Iowa or someplace like that. And the train fell in a, in a valley 75 feet down. The trestle collapsed as the train was going apart, apart, across. Well, Philip got out and he was safe, but his wife was still there. So he went back to see if he could rescue her. And he was never seen again, his wife never seen again. So, a very sad story. But the thing about it is there were these two tremendous tragedies of people who have blessed us in such a wonderful way. Mm -hmm. So when you sing this song, think about the fact that this man wrote these wonderful words shortly before his death and everything. So, that's part of the story. It's just a great story. Thank you. Okay? All right, thanks. <laughs> As we depart this morning, I want to remind you, please grab your dynamite prayer book before you leave today on your way out. We also have uh, our Chris, uh, Operation Christmas Child desk out there as well. If you have not had a chance, receive this benediction as we go today. Go bravely and boldly into this world of confusion and pain. Bring God's healing words of love and forgiveness. Know the power of mercy and grace in your life and use those wonderful gifts to serve God by serving his people. Go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.